All right, how is everybody? It's good to see you here this evening. Welcome home again. Again, thank you for those who are joining us online. We are beginning a brand new series, a brand new year, a brand new thing the Bible describes. And so it's called Nonsense, Making Sense of a God Who Often Doesn't. And this is a series from the book of Judges. We're going to go from the life of Gideon to the life of Samson to the life of Ruth. And so those are the next series, the three series over the next three months. And so we begin with Gideon. Message number one, grace is nonsense. Don't say amen to that, but that's just the title. Grace, you're not going, thank you, you're on top of it. So grace is nonsense. We're going to jump in. If you want to watch on the screen or your phone or your Bible, you're welcome to, but it will be on the screen. As we begin, let's just pray one more time. Father in heaven, as we dig in, we are praying that your Holy Spirit would teach us. Help us to hear and see something from your word that we've never seen before. Help us to hear something we've never heard before that speaks directly to our situation. And Lord, help us not just to hear it, but to respond to it. Thank you so much. We praise you and thank you. Let everyone say amen. Amen. We are in Judges chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of who? Midian for how long? Seven years, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, the strongholds, which are in the mountains. So it was, verse 3, whenever Israel had sown, planted, Midianites would come up. They would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth and leave no sustenance for Israel. Verse 6, so Israel was greatly impoverished and did what? Cried out to the Lord. Do you understand the scenario here is that the Midianites were bigger, uh, stronger than the Israelites. And so whenever they would plant something, the Midianites would come up and they would take it or destroy it. The result of that was, according to the Bible, is they had no sustenance. In other words, they didn't have food. Food was scarce. They were hungry and they were impoverished. What happened as a result of that, verse 6, Israel did what? They cried out to God. As we begin 2024 and God is wanting to do a new thing, here's the question. How will we approach? How will you and I individually and corporately as the body of Christ enter 2024? I would suggest, based on even what Israel did in this instance, that we approach or we enter into this new year in persistent personal and group-based prayer. Persistent. You know that lady. She kept going to that judge and said, get justice for me. Get just, kept not, get just, and he just kept saying, listen, I, I don't even care about this, but because this lady will not leave me alone, I'm going to have to do something about it. She was just persistent. This story is given to give us the illustration to keep on praying. Even when it seems like nothing's happening, doesn't mean God isn't working. Keep on asking. Keep on praying. Keep on seeking God. Of course, it's Jesus and um, his Sermon on the Mount, he talks about prayer several times, but one of which he talks about uh, praying in the, the secret place, right? Just praying, going in the closet, shut the door, and pray. So as you enter into 2024, that you would have this space, you most likely have seen the movie. If you have not, oh, that's good news, here comes an advertisement. We just purchased the rights to be able to show War Room among this group, and so we're going to do that. We've got to find a date, but I love that movie because it's inspiring. Last time I showed it to a group like this, we left with 10 small groups with 10 different leadership teams. As a result of that, we had 100 people in small groups, 40 of which had never been to church. So it was pretty, it was pretty cool. So we're going to show that again, and it's just an inspiring, it's fun, it has some funny parts, all this kind of stuff. It's entertaining, but it has an amazing message about persistent personal prayer, having this space where you get into the shadow of the Almighty. Just get into the shadow of God and pray and seek Him. But not only that, but group-based prayer that we would come together. I would suggest to you as this uh, week ago yesterday, we had the time here at the church from 7 p.m. to 12 a.m. Yes, that's five hours here at the church. And we had no planned agenda other than we were going to be in a room and read the Bible and so, as I mentioned last time, we read the book of, what was the first book we started with? Joel, Joel was the first? No. Was it Habakkuk? No. 
Okay, Joel, Habakkuk, First Peter, uh, Malachi. There's Elizabeth right there. What else did we read? What did, Hebrews. Yes. And so then every 30 minutes, then we'd all say, if anybody would like to, a group of us would like to slot up and pray in this other room so they keep reading, we would pray in this room. So I would suggest out of that, the next night, which was last Saturday night, we saw the fruit of spending time in the presence of God. I would just, I mean, again, just the spirit being poured out. Whenever you spend time in the presence of God, it is not without fruit. God's going to do something. Something's going to happen. We don't do it just to get something, but it doesn't, uh, it does have results by being in the shadow of God. And so uh, this year, persistent personal prayer, but also persistent group prayer. The vision is this church, theoretically, I'm told, I think we put more in here than that, but this church seats 120. The vision is, and the prayer is, is that on, on Wednesday night, we have prayer meeting, that there will be at least 120 people showing up, just like an upper room described in Acts chapter 1, because as a result of that, the Holy Spirit was poured out, then the gospel was taken further. It went to Jerusalem, but then it went to Samaria, and then it went to the ends of the earth, and then they were accused of turning the world upside down. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. And so persistent, group-based uh, pers- personal and group-based prayer. In fact, one more advertisement, I wasn't planning on this, but I'll try to keep it quick, is that this Wednesday night, we're starting our new Connection class. And so I actually have the books for those who sign up for the class. And we're studying a book called Prayer Warriors. We're using that as a, a discipleship lesson to guide us in the Word of God uh, on how to uh, apply faith, how to pray individually and corporately. And it's written by, uh, he's deceased now, but Ron Halverson Sr., a former evangelist, Uh, who wrote that book. And so if you're wondering how to even go about this, hey, we've got something that could disciple you in that very, this very thing. Back to our sermon, number verse seven, it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord did what? He sent a prophet. Remember, when you pray, something happens. God does stuff when we pray that the Lord sent a prophet who said to them, thus says the Lord, I brought you up and I brought you out. It sounds a lot like the beginning of Exodus chapter 20, right before the 10 commandments are shared. I'm the Lord you God who brought you out of the land of out of the house of bondage. One, you should have no, just like that. I brought you up and I brought you out. I delivered you of all who oppressed you. Verse 10, I said to you, I am the Lord your God but you have not obeyed my voice. Another way to say it, I think, is is still true to the text, but you have not listened to my voice. Your ancestors, Israel, had this experience where I brought them out. It wasn't because they were so big and strong. No, it was my mighty hand that delivered them from a power and from a giant that was too big for them, that got them out. They had this personal experience with me. And then that was shared from generation to generation, but then people stopped talking about what I had done for them. It was lost. They didn't have their, going into this future generation, have their personal experience with me, and so they didn't have a relationship, and they didn't listen, and they didn't obey. So God sent this prophet, and the prophet comes and gives an explanation for their experience. He begins to answer the why question. So, Wayne, I I preached this sermon earlier today. I quoted you, just so you know, Uh, and I said, Wayne Stock, and applaud. No. Anyway, so on, on Wednesday night, Wayne brought out, he led us in our prayer meeting, and it was Isaiah 65, verse 24, that said, call to, call to me, or let me get it right here. Even before you call, I will answer. There we go. Even before I call, I will answer. Isn't that amazing? Before they even ask the why question here, God's giving an answer. You, the why question is about to come up here in the story. But before that actually comes in the story, God is answering the why question. And the answer to the why question is this, that their experience is the result of becoming self-reliant. Being self-reliant is the result of focusing on self. That seems pretty self-explanatory, doesn't it? Being self-reliant is a result of focusing on me, myself, and I. That's the tendency that we all have to focus on us. Oh, my life, my desires, my preferences. But the antidote to focusing on self is what Paul would describe as, you know, I'm not going to talk about anything. I'm not going to preach about anything. I'm not going to disciple anybody on anything except Christ and him crucified. 
Focusing on the cross, Jesus' cross and his crucifixion, his resurrection, that is the antidote for focusing on self. Because a focus on the cross keeps us from thinking that we are self-sufficient. It keeps us from thinking that we are self-sustaining and self-supporting. It refocuses us on the fact that we are helpless, dependent, and powerless. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. No thing. Well, I can breathe. Every breath is from him. The next heartbeat is from the creator. I mean, every single thing that we enjoy and we take for granted comes from Christ. We can't do anything apart from him. And a focus on the cross is the antidote to focusing on self. The prophet brings up the incongruence because it didn't make sense for them to continue to go the direction they were going. Do you guys get this? I mean, he, the prophet's saying, look, you're, you're living in this land that God gave you, but... The Midianites come and they're destroying all your food. Did, did you guys get there? Some, there's a problem here. You're not only physically hungry but, hungry, but you're spiritually hungry. And there's an answer to the why question in your life. And so Israel cried out to the Lord in verse 7, verse 10. The Lord sends a prophet, says, you have not obeyed my voice. Nobody's listening. It's as if God was saying, you want me to listen to you, but you have not listened to me. And so for seven years, this oppression oppression continued. And then as the people, in their distress, gave heed to the Lord's reproof and confessed their sins, God again raised up a helper for them, verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree. Now we've seen this before in the Old Testament where the angel of the Lord shows up. Remember, Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord. Um... Other instances, Manoah and his wife, that's the parents of Samson. Remember the angel, it was a a man of God came, but we figure out it was the angel of the Lord. Uh, Different instances, you know, Abraham, the travelers come by, it's the angel. I mean, on and on and on. And it's a reference to, because Israel was led through the wilderness by the angel of the Lord, right? It was that pillar of cloud, that pillar of fire. And all of a sudden, as theologians would call this a theophany, it is this pre-incarnate appearance of Christ who shows up. And he comes and sits under a terebinth tree. I'm just, I'm, isn't it just kind of interesting that Jesus shows up and just goes and sits down? I mean, I, I, maybe that's not it. I don't know if that, I mean, he could have just walked right up to him and said, I have a message for you. But he comes patiently and sits down. This tree belonged to Joash the Bezrite, while his son Gideon, what was Gideon doing? He was threshing wheat. He threshed wheat where? In the wine press. Why in the world would you do that? Well, in order to hide it from the Midianites. Again, he is threshing wheat in the wine press because the Midianites, every time you would get a little bit of food, they would come and take it. So now he's having to go to the wine press to thresh wheat. Typically, at a wine press, you press grapes. Typically, if you're going to thresh wheat, you do it out in the open, hoping there's a little breeze going by, and you throw it up, and the chaff kind of floats away, and then the wheat falls to the ground, you're left with the wheat. No, he's doing it at the wine press. Why? Because it wasn't the time of grapes. He could hide there. Nobody's going to know that I'm there. Nobody's going to be looking for me there uh, to try to steal my food. So he does this. And again, in normal life, this does not make sense, Right? I mean, we could try to think of something that would uh, be in line with that. Uh, I don't know. You're washing your car. I mean, like just something just totally ridiculous. It just doesn't make sense because of the context. But he's doing this because of what's happening. So it kind of makes sense because he does this because if he doesn't do it, they're going to steal his food. But if they weren't being oppressed by the Midianites, this wouldn't make sense, right? Right? Like, if they're not being impressed anymore, if they're gone and he keeps threshing wheat at the wine prince, that would be nonsense. That would just be silly. I notice what Isaiah says in chapter 5, verse 20. He says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Have you noticed that our world is upside down? <laughs> Got a reaction there. <laughs> that, like, good is bad and bad is good. Like, everything is just upside down. And, and, well, I'm going to keep going here. Make sure that you don't get used to living in an upside-down world. 
What I mean by that is Gideon is doing this because the Midianites in this context, in this time, if he doesn't do it right here, they're going to come and take his food. Okay. But you, I, I, I just, I wonder if as things went on, as the, the yoke of Midian was broken, right? They, they get past the Midianites. I wonder if people had gotten so used to it that some people still went to the wine press to, to thresh wheat. Why do you do that? I, I don't know. It doesn't make sense. We just do it. Because they just got so used to it. We could come up with examples of stuff like that today. But it's scary when the nonsense of this world becomes normal in the life of the church and the believer. Just normal. Here's some examples. Death. Some of you just came from a funeral service or two this afternoon. Please remember that because of the circumstances... He is threshing wheat in the wine press. It makes sense in that moment because of the context. If he doesn't, they'll take his food. If the Midianites were gone and he kept doing that, that's nonsense. Have you ever been to a funeral and you're just like, I mean, obviously, funerals across the board are sad. Sometimes somebody lives to 125 and it's like, wow, they had a great life and everyone's just celebrating that they lived so long and all that. And it's just different. But then most funerals, I mean, it's, it's heavy and all of that. But we cannot get so used to the nonsense of this world that we go into scenarios where death is involved and, and, and just mourn and we're sad. And we say, well, this is just the world we live in today. Because don't you remember what Paul said to the Thessalonians? He said, therefore, comfort one another with these words. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. Then we who are alive and remain, we caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these. In other words, yes, we're sad. Yes, we mourn. Yes, we're dead. All of that. But still, at the same time, we're saying, you know what? We're not going to get used to this because this is not going to be this way forever. Jesus is coming. Jesus will have the last word. Jesus on that cross executed death, and he's going to put it away once and for all, soon and very soon. We can't get used to it. It cannot become the norm in the life of the church and in the believer. We go through different things, sin, compromise, knowledge without obedience, knowledge without a relationship, doubt, lack of faith, unforgiveness. Time out. Jesus in his sermon on the mount, Matthew chapter 6, he goes through the Lord's prayer. At the end of the prayer, what did he say? It goes into forgiving, forgiveness. So, I mean, I've heard it before. We say, you know what? I... Yes, yes, all this, that person, that, but not that person, because you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what she did to me. You don't know what he did to me. There's no way I could ever. Of course, we call time out and say, well, hold on a second. What has Jesus done for you and for me? The Bible says that while we were still sinners. In other words, while we were still in active rebellion against him, God sent his son to die for you and me. He sends this grace to us. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. He does it because he loves us, because he wants to redeem us, and he forgives us freely. In the same way that we have been forgiven, we are now called in the power of Christ to extend that same forgiveness to anybody and everybody, no matter what, no matter what, no matter what they have done to us. You say, well, I can't do that. And I say, this is from the Greek, no duh. Right? That's the gospel. Christ doing for us that which we can't do for ourselves. It is the power of Christ in us. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do. Not just to hear what he says, but then to actually live out what he says in our lives. How do you do that? Man, you're so spiritual. Man, you're so... Listen, I'm not in anything. It's Christ. He did it. And somebody says, I can tell. You've been with him. Just like those relig- all those people were saying about those disciples. You've been with him. He's rubbing off on you. He's starting to take up residence inside of you. We cannot get to the place where there is a normalcy, where the followers of Christ take a position where they do not forgive. Because that's nonsense. That is not in line with Scripture or the calling of Christ on your life. The next one would be prayerlessness. God's people are called to pray. You say, I, I try to pray, and then I run out of stuff to say. You've heard me say it before. Okay, then get out your Bible while you pray. Have it open and allow his word to direct the conversation. Amen. You don't have anything to say? Well, then read back what he said to you. And just begin to pray his word because it will not be without fruit. His word doesn't just 
disappear. No, it doesn't return void. It accomplishes that which it was sent for. God does something. Christ does something. We have to be a people of prayer because Jesus started his church by sending, they say, should we go? Should we go? Should we go? No, I want you to go and sit in a room together. What? And just go and wait. Yeah, but should we tell somebody? No, go wait together. And I want you to tell the stories of what I did. I want you to tell the stories of what I said. I want you to begin to cry out in my name. I want you to start to pray. All of a sudden, we're told that they began to forgive each other. There was repentance. There was a turning to the Lord. There was conversions that were happening of heart, and there was a change in them. And all of a sudden, when the day came, there was this sound of a wind, and the Holy Spirit descended, and there was power. Of course, Jesus says, wait, because when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you have power to share the gospel. This power, the Greek is dunamos, which you've heard it a gazillion times in every sermon, from which we get the word dynamite. So in other words, you will have explosive power from the Holy Spirit to blow up satanic strongholds to take the gospel further. We have to be a prayerful people. Jesus started his church with a group of prayers. He will end their time on this earth with a group of prayers. We're relying upon his word coming together and just seeking him. Back to our sermon, verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, talking to Gideon, you mighty man of valor. Now, Gideon did not have a full dress army uniform. He did not have medals. He was not declarated as the, uh, what do you get? What's the highest thing? Not a general, but uh, uh, what did Desmond Doss get? Medal Congressional... Congressional Medal of Honor. He didn't get that or anything, right? He didn't have all this declarations as his mighty valor. You know, he'd saved all these lives. Or uh, Harry Bailey, who had uh, shot down the plane so it didn't crash into the transport on It's a Wonderful Life. I mean, he didn't have any of that. But Jesus looks at him and says, I'm with you. You mighty man of valor. He's thinking to himself, you must be thinking of somebody else in some different wine press. Because I'm not... But we've noticed this through Scripture, if you've been with us or listened at all, that Jesus declares you to be now what He is creating you to be, right? Again, I'm going to reiterate, try to fly through it really quick, is that this thing called justification, when the light of the cross shines into your life, and all of a sudden you see what Jesus has done for you. It's the antidote to focusing on self. You see what Jesus has given, his humility, his, his gentleness, which is his controlled strength. He could have gotten out of there in a second. He could have called legions of angels. He could have just walked home. I mean, he could have done anything, but he stays there because he's in love with you and with me, right? And when he does that, all of a sudden, that light shining from the cross brings us to a decision. And we come to, you've been over here on Southern's campus or over on Rudolph Ringgold, you come to a roundabout. And you, if you come to a roundabout, there's another car coming from the other side. You've got to make a decision. Are you going to yield? And that's the light shining from the cross. Are you going to yield? Are you going to allow Jesus to take uh, supremacy? Are you going to allow him to go before you, to lead you? And if you say yes, and you confess, Lord, I am broken, I am sinful, Lord, would you forgive me? Would you cover me? I believe what you said. You are Lord and my Savior. We are told that in that moment you are saved. His righteousness covers you. And when God the Father sees you, he sees you perfect. And your account is accounted as perfectly righteous. Justification right? That's like the thief on the cross. Would you remember me? And he goes, yes. Just, just yes, right? A little bit longer than that, but essentially yes. For the rest of us, he, he died on the cross, a thief, right? But for the rest of us, Ninja says, okay, let's go. And it's that starting that day by getting into his presence and saying, may every step be a step in the direction you're calling me to go. And as you walk with him, as you grow with him, what he does is, again, repeating myself about every week, is he does this amazing thing that the Bible describes, Old Testament, New Testament, where he goes in and takes out a heart of stone. A heart of stone is, is unmalleable. It's unpliable. But he puts in a heart of flesh. On that fle- heart of flesh is his character, is his law. And we again begin to look just like him. It's back to Eden again. Right? Adam and Eve, can you imagine Eve talking to Cain and Abel? And they said, Mom, Mom, what did the Creator look like? And she said, Oh, man, He looked just like your dad. 
created in his image. And Jesus is recreated to look like him, just like him in his image. But he declares us to be now righteous, what he's going to actually put inside of us, which is his righteousness, the hope of glory. Verse 13, Gideon said to him, oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, here it is. He finally asked the question, why? Why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt, did not, uh, but now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Isn't it interesting that thousands of years later, we're still asking the same questions, uh, we're, and we're still coming to the same conclusions. Isn't that interesting? We're still asking why and where. Why did God let that happen? Why would you do that, God? Where's all those miracles I read about? Jesus, you were around and blind people were sitting, where, where, where is it all? We'll take a little stab at this tonight to answer the why question. First, I would say this is the Bible described that we live in a broken world where there is an enemy. We live in a sinful world and there is an enemy. Of course, the Lord asked Satan in the context of Job, where you come from? I come from walking to and fro on the earth. In other words, he's saying, wherever my feet have touched, I'm coming from my territory, right? He was claiming it as his. And his primary goal, his MO is to steal, kill, and destroy. He's not messing around. He's trying to steal your joy. He's trying to steal your faith. He's trying to steal your time with Jesus. He's trying to kill you. He's trying to destroy you. In no uncertain terms, this is what he's trying to do. And so he's bringing challenges and difficulties into your life and into mine. Another possible answer to the why question is that you or I have departed from the best path the Lord has called us to. We don't like that one as much. Uh, but that's a reality, I think. The Lord has said, hey, this is the best path. I like to describe, a little side note, the Ten Commandments, it sounds like, oh, man, this is the do's and don'ts. What, what I would suggest is those are the boundaries of the relationship. Amen. They're the beautiful boundaries of the relationship. Because you wouldn't describe your marriage, as, ah, she says, I can't have a girlfriend. You know, no, I mean, <laughs> maybe there's a better example. But do you know what I'm saying? In other words, the boundary of the relationship is you have one person. She has one person. You have one person. That's what I'm trying to communicate. Um, it's the boundaries of the relationship. And when we go uh, in a different way and we ignore the voice of God and go in a different direction, uh, sometimes that leads us in a very difficult path. So that can be some of the results that we experience in our lives. Another reason would be if the Lord is allowing the bad to develop righteousness in you. Remember Lord, I believe you. I put my faith in you. are declared righteous. And then he's now going to, you're going to be in the relationship and a process of him actually putting it, literally putting it in you. Notice what the Bible says. James chapter 1, verse 2 says this, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, difficulties, testings, verse 3, knowing that the testing or the trial or the difficulty uh, of your faith does what? It produces it produces patience. So somebody tonight who's going through something difficult, this should be some good news, that the difficult thing that you're going through, uh, God's going to use. It's not purposeless. Satan may mean it for bad, but God can use it for good. Knowing that the testing produces patience, I love this verse because it takes me to Revelation chapter 14. Here is the patience of the saints who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is a verse, a culmination of, an, uh, of a, a description of individuals after the proclamation of the everlasting gospel have personally experienced, had a personal experience is the thi this thing called righteous by faith. And under the, uh, after the, the, the invitation of Christ to come out, they have come in. And he has done this work in them of righteous by faith, using the difficult to produce the good. Here's another verse, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. Uh, now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Can I get an amen? amen. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of what? Chastening yields righteousness. The hard, the difficult can yield righteousness. In other words, Jesus, Satan's going to bring something to your life, and God's going to say, watch this, uh, Allah uh, Joseph, when he was taken, sold by his brothers, but Joseph said, hey, guys, guys, don't be so mad at yourselves. God took what you meant for evil and did good with it. 
And so he wants to use these hard things to produce his character in you and in me. Because of the imputed righteous justification of Christ, they are accounted precious. Go to the highlighted, underlined parts. He does not see the sinner. He recognizes in them his son. He sees the characteristics of Jesus in you and me as he puts his righteousness in us. Now, I have to tell you, and this is where they get the title, that this just doesn't make a lot of sense. If you're a mathematician, teacher of math, it doesn't make a lot of sense that God would do all this for you and for me. And it's not supposed to necessarily make sense. Love doesn't make sense. Why are you doing all that? Because I love her. Because I love him. Yeah, but they don't des- but I love them. Parents know this, right? Your kids, they, they do some things. They don't listen to you. Or they, uh, clean your room. They didn't clean their room. Do this. They got a bad grade. doesn't mean you stop loving them. doesn't mean you stop providing for them. doesn't mean that you're not going to go after them and, and chase them and support them and love on them. It doesn't make sense, but yet God applies this to you and me. I love what it says here in Revelation 3.20. You know this verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Who is this? This is Jesus. If anyone hears my knocking, no, it's not what it says, right? What does it say? So he's knocking at the door. If anyone hears my voice, again, here we are, 3,000, whatever, years later, 3,000 years later, from Gideon saying, why and where? Asking the same questions. And And the answer had come, listen. I, I did all of this. You, your, your ancestors, your parents, your grandparents, they experienced my power, but now no one's obeying. No one's listening. Here we are, millennia removed. We're back in the same boat. Jesus speaks to you and me and says, listen, I'm at the door, and I'm knocking on the door of your life, the door of your heart. If anyone would finally be listening, I will come into them and dine with them and they with me. So have you ever thought about that part? So the light shining from the cross, Jesus is there. If you yield and you open the door, Jesus says, I'll come in and we're going to have a meal together. What I would suggest tonight is at any moment when you hear the voice of God speaking directly to you through his word, uh, through a testimony that's shared up front, or I mean, I'm just saying tonight, Anytime you hear the Spirit of God speaking to you, that is the time to respond. Not later and say, you know, I'm going to think about it. Uh, Let let me just kind of mull that over for a little bit. That is a dangerous decision because Satan's going to do everything he can to get in the way of stealing that connection. He's going to shout. God whispers, but Satan shouts. He's going to shout. He's going to cause all kinds of distractions to get in the way from you hearing that voice again in the near future and from you contemplating what God is saying to you. So when he speaks to you, now is the time to respond. Now is the time to yield. Now is the time to make a decision to open the door, put the door, stop down, and say, come in and stay in. And Jesus says, we're going to have a meal together. In answer to the why question, many weren't listening and where are, all your, where are all your miracles? Well, there was lots of miracles, but thousands of unclaimed mercies. God wanted to do so much, but no one was listening. Verse 14, then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Verse 15, notice the response, just in the underlined parts. He says, how can I? I am the least. Or the weakest. I can't do this. What are you talking about? You want me to go? They're going to be saved by me? How can I do that? I am the least. I am the smallest. Have you been to my village? Have you been to my town? I'm the most insignificant. My voice, nobody listens to me. I'm the least. What I would suggest to you tonight is that what you and I bring to the table has nothing to do with what is for lunch. I can't do it. Lord, what I bring to the table isn't much. And he says, listen, what you bring to the table has nothing to do with it. I'm inviting you to the table. Because if anyone hears my voice and lets me in, we're going to have a meal together. 
and what's on the table and what's all set there. I'm going to take care of all of that. You, don't bring, you may bring stuff to the table. But you may bring your brokenness and your selfishness and all this kind of stuff. But I'm going to bring everything that you need. And you just need to say yes and come to the table. And I will have everything that you need. Because faith is believing what God has said. Faith is basing your movements what God has said. You are who God says you are. I appreciate this uh, quote from one of my favorite authors. It says, the Savior's promise to his disciples is a promise to his church to when? To the end of time. God did not design that his wonderful plan to redeem men should achieve only insignificant results. All who go to work, who, all who will go to work, trusting not in what they themselves can do, but in what God can do for them, will certainly realize the fulfillment of this promise. Greater works than these shall you do, because I go to my Father. How about another one? The Lord is disappointed when his people place a low esteem on themselves. He desires his chosen heritage to value themselves according to the price he has placed upon them. God wanted them or else he would not have sent his son on such a what? Expensive errand to redeem them. He has a use for you. He has a use for me. He has a use for us. And he is well pleased when they make the very highest demands upon him, that they may glorify his name. They may expect, expect large things if they have faith in his promises. How can I? I'm the smallest. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you. You shall de defeat the Midianites as one man. I believe this to be true, that you plus the Lord is always a majority. You and I as individuals plus the Lord is always a majority. You see, his presence makes the difference. So seek his presence. Uh, that first part was uh, for a church I preached at today. But you're having trouble in your marriage. You have a family marriage. Seek his presence. You're stuck somewhere in life. Seek his presence. You have an addiction. Seek his presence. You remember the story of the disciples when they were in the boat? Jesus had gone off to pray. He sent them off by themselves. This crazy storm shows up. And they're bailing water. They're sinking fast. And they're, maybe, maybe they are praying. They are crying out, but they're wanting the storm to stop. They were tempted to pray for the storm to pass. More than calm seas, they needed his presence. Because watch this, when he got there, they could walk on water. The storm was still going on when Peter came out, right? But it didn't matter because he was there. The temptation that we're, all of us are is to get to our list when we're praying, Lord, would you do this? Would you do that? Do that. I'm not against any list. I think we should be specific when we pray about very, you know, specific, specific things in our lives. But as we said before, and Bobby and different ones, before we seek his hand, we should seek his face, seek his presence. Verse 17, then he, thus Gideon, said to the Lord, if I've now found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that if it is you who talk with me, that it is you who talk with me. Do not depart from here, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you. And he said, the Lord said, I will wait until you come back. Verse 19, so Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread and brought them out to him under the terebinth tree and presented them. Please keep in mind, food is very, very scarce. Verse 20, the angel of God said to him, take the meat, the unleavened bread, and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. So saturate it, soak it, just, just spill it all out there on the rock, on the food. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of his staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread, and the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. <sighs> Gone. Notice what Gideon says. Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Have you ever noticed that in Scripture? When people realize that they've been in the presence of God, they think they're going to die immediately? Well, why is that? Again, I mentioned before, Manoah and his wife, that's Samson's parents, they thought they were going to die when, they, when the angel went up in the flame and disappeared. There's different instances in Scripture where all of a sudden they think they're going to die, and it's like, 
it seems like just common sense would say, well, if, if God's just going to kill me right here, he wouldn't have come and said, I have this big plan for you, right? Why did they think that? I've shared this story before, but just in, in, in short, my friend Q, Robert Quintana, so we called him Q, we worked in the dormitory over here at Southern, and one of the, the guys on his hall, Satan had control of his life. He was str- beyond struggling, and so a group of of the guys and one of the professors from the religion department uh, got in that room and they were praying. There was a group out in the stairwell, they were praying, and they prayed all night long. And I won't say that when God showed up, because I believe God was there the whole time, but when they became aware of his presence. My friend Q will tell you, as his face, this is no exaggeration, as his face was pressed against the carpet, He said, we became very, very aware that God was there. And when we became aware of his presence, we could not get low enough. He said, if I could have, I'm serious, I would have pulled up the carpet and tried to hide underneath it because there was a holy presence there. God was there. Why do people always feel like they're going to die when they feel like they've seen God? Because the presence of God dominates. It just does. What does the Bible say? That when he comes back again, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Because, I mean, God now has masked himself when he came. He, he clothed himself in humanity, and he looked like just one of us. People didn't realize. I mean, they would have flashes and say, yeah, we're looking for Jesus. So, I am. And also, boom, they fall on their faces. You remember that when they came to arrest him? I mean, he, he's so gracious to us. He's so kind to us, but he's coming back, and, and we, we, we tend to forget that he is God. A gazillion angels worship him. They, they've been around him for how many, a million years? I mean, who knows? And they never get tired of worshiping and falling down and worshiping because he is God. He speaks, and it is. There's nothing too hard for him. We pray about things and we say, Lord, would you, we try to tell God what to do. And again, I'm not saying we shouldn't be specific, but I'm just saying what we need to do is be very intentional about inviting his presence to be with us, that we'd be aware of his presence because when he shows up, he dominates. And whatever the Satan's plan is, gets dominated by the King of kings and Lord of every Lord. He's the one. We just need to be close to him. Lord, would you have the store pass? Would you help the winds to stop? Would you have the waves to stop? They just needed Jesus to come. Because when he came, the winds kept blowing, the waves kept going, and Peter is walking on the water in the midst of the storm because Jesus has arrived. Verse 23, then the Lord said to him, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. So he shows up again. You shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, the Lord is peace. To this day, it is still in Ophrah of the Abizrites. Isn't that amazing? that there was generations of of Israelites who had stopped listening, who had stopped worshiping the true God. And after this experience, Gideon builds an altar here. And this altar stays. When the author wrote this, he said, it's still there. You can go see it. In fact, we can go worship at it right now and cry out to God and listen to him. There was a change. There was a shift in everything that was happening here. In this moment in the story, as we launch into this series, where all of a sudden, after this experience that Gideon has had, it begins to kind of percolate. It begins to seep out in the experience of those who lived in his town, where people began to worship again and listen to his voice. I've appreciated the story of a young girl, um, age of 16. She was sick and tired of listening to her parents. She'd gotten a nose ring. Her dad was upset about that. She was sick and tired of his opinion about that. They didn't like her music, so she was sick and tired of them bugging her about that. They didn't like the guy she was talking to. She was sick and tired of that. So one night, she just said, you know what? I am out of here. I am going to leave. And so she got her backpack. She got all of the money that she could, and she snuck out the window and got a bus ticket from Traverse City, Michigan to Detroit, about six to seven hours away. She was going to start her own new life. She had a, a plan, and this is going to be a much better life. When she got there, she had a little bit of money. She started to live. She had a, got a hotel there for a few nights, but before long, she discovered, wait a second, money doesn't last very long. She began to run out of money. She got a job there working for a guy that put her to work. 
because she became so desperate, she got this job working at Amazon. She began to work at night, uh, working um, in the night as a prostitute. It was okay, she thought, for a while, because money was coming in. She had an awesome place to stay. Her needs, she thought, were taken care of, and things were going okay until she got sick. When she got sick, she got put out. No place to stay. There was no income. She still had a little bit of money, so a little bit, a little, uh, but before she knew it, she was out of money. She was still very sick. She began to stay at homeless shelter. She began to get her clothes from homeless shelter. She began to eat at soup kitchens, this kind of thing. It's the dead of winter in Detroit, Michigan. That's not a very nice environment. She's literally sleeping outside under cardboard, under those vents, you know, where the warm air comes up in the city there, among other people, and, and just living this life. 18 months go by, and this 16-year-old, who is now almost 18 years old, does not look like an 18-year-old. She looks like she's like 58 years old. Dark circles under her eyes, scraggly, sick, then she looks terrible. It is one night under a piece of cardboard as the warm air is coming up that all of a sudden her mind goes back to the time in Traverse City. She grew up on a farm there where there was cherry trees, there was tall grass in the summertime. She had a golden retriever and she would throw the tennis ball and the, the, the ball would bounce and there was that golden retriever bouncing, getting that ball. And she just kind of smiled as she remembered home. In that same instant, she began to remember mom and dad. Oh man, her heart began to ache her heart began to yearn to just to want to go home. It was the next morning. She didn't have any change or anything. This is the time when there were still pay phones, but she panhandled just enough money, enough change to make the call, and she calls home. She never forgot that number, her home number, and she got the machine. It was her dad's voice after the message, leave, or after the beep, leave a message, beep, mom, dad, it's Sarah. I want to come home. I'm going to get a bus uh, tomorrow into Traverse City there, midnight. If you're there, great. And she hung up. She panhandled just enough money to be able to get the bus ticket. That next day, she's on the bus. She had her backpack. And it's a little over a six-hour trip there. And the whole time, she's practicing her speech. I'm so sorry. I, I won't do that again. All these different things. The trip went like that because she's just practicing and practicing. She's awoken out of her practicing by the air brakes of the bus as the bus driver on the microphone says, Traverse City. Her heart began to beat fast. Everyone else got off the bus. It's midnight there. It's snowing in Traverse City. The lights of the parking lot. She, before she gets out, she pulls out her little compact there, opens up a little mirror, and she's just trying to cover up with the 18 months of dark circles. She's the last one off the bus. Will they be there? She goes inside that terminal. She opens the door. And there's no way she could have been prepared for what happened next. Because there in that room, there was a massive banner and said, welcome home, Sarah. There was every, all of her friends and family, people she didn't even know from the town. They had party hats on. They had, they had the noisemakers. There were streamers everywhere. Everyone began to shout and celebrate. There was a roar of applause as everyone said, welcome home, Sarah. There is her mom running across that terminal there, throwing her arms around her. She is bawling her eyes out. My girl, my daughter, as she's being hugged by her mom, she looks up and out of the corner of her eye sees her dad. She barely recognizes him. He too has dark circles. His hair is even more gray now because right after she left, he quit his job and spent the last 18 months looking for his little girl. He pushes his way through, throws his arms around his little girl and her mom at the same time. Sarah then pushes back from both of them and she says, Mom, Dad, I'm so sorry. Begins to go into her speech. In that moment, her dad says, Shh, Sarah, there's no time for that. We've got to get you home. We have a party and a celebration planned for you. And he threw his arms around her again, and they went home. This young girl, her parents could have said all kinds of things. You know what you did to us? You know what you put us through? No, but they loved her so much that they applied the grace to her. It doesn't make sense to a lot of people, but to them it made all the sense in the world because their daughter who was lost was found. Their daughter who was gone was brought home. Can I tell you about a carpenter by the name of Jesus who is still building things? He is building a place for you and for me. I don't believe he's just talking it into place because I, I, I could be wrong, but I, I believe he's actually building places for you and for me because he wants above everything to spend forever with us together that where I am there, they may be also was his prayer to his father. And now he's calling out back then, but in 2024, in the closing moments of earth's history, before he comes back, Jesus is calling who is listening 
He says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and yields and opens that door, I will come in. But Lord, I've got, I don't have, I can't. He says, you know what? What you bring to the table has nothing to do with what we're having for lunch. I'm supplying with everything that's on the table. I have everything that you need. I've done it all. There's nothing you need to do. I have done it. If you will yield to me, friend, 99% doesn't make it. It is 100%. It is 100% yielding to Christ. It is 100% saying, Lord, here I am. And again, I would submit to you based on the words of Jesus who said, without me, you can do nothing. You can't even do that on your own other than say it and make a decision. And then you are, you're empowered to follow through on the decision by Christ. He does it. And that is going to be our anthem and song here and then. How did you? What happened? It wasn't me. It was Jesus. He's really strong. He's really big. He's really powerful, and he did it. It wasn't me. It was him. He set the table. I said yes. I invite Caleb and Bree to lead us in our next song. Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. In Christ i 
God Sing a new song in the sight of the Lord Sing a new song in the sight of the Lord Sing a new song in the sight of the Lord Sing a new song in the sight of the Lord And he wonder where the Lord is calling you to yield tonight. It could be in regards to the person or situation you have vowed to never apply forgiveness to. But will you yield to Christ and say, all right, give me forgiveness in that situation towards them, it, whatever. Maybe it's something else. Um, maybe it's surrendering your entire life to Him, not 99%. I don't know what it is. But if the Lord is calling you to yield tonight in any aspect of your life, maybe it's all of your life, would you do that tonight? In the moment that you hear the voice of Christ, that is the time to respond. Now is the moment to yield to His voice because it's a privilege to hear the voice of God, that He would speak to you and me. He doesn't do it... For any other reason than he's in love with you and can't stop thinking about you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, may there be a round of yeses here tonight that as we come to the roundabout of life, that we say, Lord, you go and I will follow you. Thank you so much for the way you love us. Thank you for sending your son, Father. Lord Jesus, thank you for showing up and talking to Gideon. We praise you. And so, Lord, tonight... Here we are so many years later, and you're still at that door. Lord, give us ears that hear, eyes that see, and hearts that understand. Lord, help us not to become so distracted that we don't hear you and obey you and follow you with 100% submission and commitment. Lord, we could do nothing apart from you, but you promised that in you and through you, we could do all things. So here we are. Lord, among this group, would you continue uh, to give testimonies? Um, taking people from death into life, out of Satan's book of death into the Lamb's book of life. We pray for more baptisms. We pray for that kind of decision. We pray for marriages that are struggling tonight. We pray for those who are addicted. That's all of us to something. But Lord, we turn from that and turn to you. And Lord, may we focus on the cross. Thank you for the antidote from focusing on self. We love you and can't wait to come back and get us. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen. amen. Thank you for joining us here tonight. As always, there's a full meal prepared uh, that everyone is invited to. We would love for you to stay and hang out with us. Again, thank you so much for being here next week. Obviously, is our second part in our series called the Nonsense Series. We hope to see you then. Good night.